Hello again, and welcome back to YCP Chemistry Labs, your College of Pennsylvania's YouTube channel to get you ready for lab each and every week. Today we're talking about aspirin part three, the third week of our group of experiments that's focused on synthesizing aspirin and now analyzing it uh, for its purity. Last week in lab, hopefully you were able to conduct some qualitative tests, that is tests that uh, showed that your material that you produced in the first week matched aspirin in its behavior or perhaps showed that there was still some leftover salicylic acid in the uh, sample that you collected. Hopefully you saw that your recrystallized sample showed a higher a grade of aspirin, meaning a greater percentage of aspirin in the sample than salicylic acid than was perhaps present in the raw sample. So let's see what we're doing today. We're looking once again at these same two chemicals, aspirin and salicylic acid. The salicylic acid is where we started this whole process. We conducted a reaction that added, uh, if you remember it's called an esterification reaction, that added a little chunk to it and this is known as acetyl salicylic acid officially uh, but commonly referred to as aspirin. You see that these two are pretty similar. All we did was appear to take the H off here and add on another uh, group to this instead and that's what we call the esterification reaction. These two do have a lot of chemical similarities uh, and in fact they both could be used as analgesics, pain relievers, and uh, for a long, long time people have used salicylic acid or salicylin derived from the bark of willow trees uh, as a pain reliever. However, uh, it turns out that this chemical is a little harsher on a lot of people's digestive systems and our stomachs and so while you might be offsetting the pain associated with a headache, you might be developing a stomach ache in, in uh, exchange. So when uh, aspirin was synthesized, we realized that it sort of negated some of those effects and the, the very first aspirin was named bufferin, first commercial aspirin, uh, because it seemed to buffer those effects caused by salicylic acid. So there's a little history for you. Now one of the ways that these also behave differently we saw last week in the uh, qualitative test is that salicylic acid will react with uh, iron three ions in solution and they produce that deep purple color that we saw. Hopefully you saw that in your tests. On the other hand, the acetyl salicylic acid, now that we have uh, placed the acetate group here, will not react with the iron three chloride ions. So we were able to use this just as a, a quick and dirty uh, color test to tell us if there was salicylic acid present last week. But this week we'll, able, we'll be able to quantitatively measure the amount of salicylic acid that might be in our samples. And we're going to use Beer's Law to do that. If that sounds familiar, it should. Uh, we've used Beer's Law before in the general chemistry curriculum, uh, in particular in our chemistry one courses here at York where you measured the absorbance of a series of solutions containing iron once again. Beer's law tells us that the absorbance of any solution is proportional to the concentration of the chemical in that solution and it is a linear relationship. So if you had four or five solutions, you would see a nice straight line, if I could draw a straight line, through them. In other words, this should be a Y equals MX plus B connection, and in reality, the B should really be zero. Because if there's no concentration, there really should be no zero. Sometimes if your uh, solutions are a little less than perfect though, you might have a very small B value there. Now how can we use this to our advantage? Well in lab today, what you're going to do is prepare first a series of solutions where you know the concentration of salicylic acid in them. So for example, these five 
X's that I've put up here on the board would be solutions that you know exactly how much was in there. You're going to do that by dilution. We will provide a solution for you with a known concentration of salicylic acid. And you in turn will measure out a small volume of that known solution. Let's call it solution one. You will then add a bunch of water to it and that will dilute the amount of iron uh, that's in, in, or salicylic acid, sorry. These are salicylic acid solutions. It will dilute the amount of salicylic acid, thus decreasing the concentration. So you can solve for the new concentration by dividing by V2 on each side of the equation here. So the new molarity, the resulting molarity, in each of these what we call standards uh, is going to be found by taking the original solution's concentration times the volume that you diluted divided by the new volume of solution that you prepared. Okay. Now these are called standards. That word standard is used in a variety of different ways in the English language. One way is a standard against which you compare something. And that's how we're going to use it in lab here. We'll prepare five of these standards and then we will be able to compare solutions against those standards where we don't know how much salicylic acid is present. So that's sort of the next phase of our work. Mimicking the same sort of process as you did for your standards, you'll prepare solutions of your aspirin samples. That would mean your raw sample, your recrystallized sample, and then also a store-bought sample for comparison to what we can get commercially. You'll measure the absorbance of all the solutions. The standards and their concentrations will give you this graph or a graph similar to this. You'll use the Excel program to generate the y equals mx plus b plot. Then your unknowns, your aspirin samples, may fall somewhere on this curve, hopefully, and you can determine their concentrations. Now you could attempt to eyeball this here, but in reality, you will want to get a more accurate measure of the concentration. You will know the Y value, and so for, for the aspirin solutions, The x would equal, well, if you had a b, it would be y minus b divided by m. Or if you get rid of the b, it would just be x equals y divided by the slope of this graph. That would be the concentration of salicylic acid in your solution. And then concentration times volume is how you would get moles because molarity is moles divided by volume. So the moles of salicylic acid would equal the molarity that you just found from up here times the volume of the solution. And then mass would be moles times the molar mass of the salicylic acid. That's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves because that's part of the data analysis. And I hope to prepare another video where I walk you through some of that data analysis and give you a nice overview of the entire Aspirin project for the large formal lab report that you'll need to write. But as far as the procedure goes this week, the colors are certainly going to look familiar because you're going to see those deep purple colors that you saw in the qualitative iron 3 chloride test last laboratory period. You want to use good measurement technique because our ability to accurately quantify the amount of salicylic acid in our solutions depends on how good our standards are. So that's really where the investment of your time is in this exercise, is accurately measuring the volumes for your standards and following those dilution uh, instructions carefully. And then also accurately weighing out the amounts of aspirin that you put into your uh, solutions that you make here. Those are going to be the two uh, 
tips that I could give you to get the most accurate results. What will we find? Well, if things have played out as historically they have for this experiment, I would hope you'd find that your recrystallized sample of aspirin has a higher purity of aspirin, meaning a lower mass of salicylic acid present, than does the raw sample. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if your recrystallized sample compares very favorably to the store-bought sample of aspirin. Okay? In general, this aspirin synthesis does give us a pretty pure product, even though the raw sample might not look anywhere near as clean as the recrystallized sample. All right? So this week your uh, task is pretty clear. Good luck with that and I'll see you next time when we talk about how to analyze this data and write the report for this experiment.